Every time Ant-Man has shown up in the MCU, there's something weirdly inconsistent with him. Be it his character or his powers, the biggest issue comes with how the first film establishes his powers work. Darren Cross, Hope, and Hank all say the same thing. When I took over this company for Dr. Pym, I immediately started researching a particle that could change the distance between atoms while increasing density and strength. 40 years ago, I created a formula that altered atomic relative distance. Huh? I learned how to change the distance between atoms. That's what powers the suit. When your small energy is compressed, so you have the force of a 200 pound man behind a fist a hundredth of an inch wide, you're like a bullet. Unfortunately, the film breaks this rule for its entire runtime. If the pin particle can only change distance between atoms, making the mass remain the same, and therefore the density increase, that means that, for one, Scott should still weigh like his 200 pound self, as Hope even puts it about his punches. However, we also need to understand the effect someone's density has on their state in the world relating to how they can get off the ground or even move at all. Something that has the same volume as something else, but is way denser, would be stopped less by air resistance and pushed down further by the fact you're submerged in air which is way less dense than they are. Same way, something being less dense than air can make it float. I made your atomic matrix slightly lighter than air, and now your shoes are heavier than air, which makes you neutrally buoyant. Meaning a very dense person would have a hard time moving if they were compressed to being as tiny as Ant-Man is. With that logic, the only thing that makes sense with Ant-Man is that his punches would be devastating as it's a lot of energy behind a very small surface area. But even then, he wouldn't be able to move that fast to have a punch that can be that strong and anyway, because you would be pushed down by the phenomenon called drag. Like when you try to move your hands in water very fast and it feels like you need to put a lot more force behind it to do so. This all means that Ant-Man's powers are useless if we remain consistent with what was established by the three characters who know about the Pym Particle. Unfortunately, the film continuously contradicts the established rules, which I find to be very damaging to the narrative as it's foundationally built on these rules that are contradicted, which could have so easily been avoided if they had simply said the Pym Particle is some sci-fi bullshit that makes you shrink and makes you stronger and more agile. So I want to go through Ant-Man's films and his MCU appearance and point out all the inconsistencies because I'm probably autistic or something, alright, sue me. Um, but yeah, let's start with Ant-Man. In Ant-Man, when Scott first shrinks and hits the ground, he would fall like a meteor towards the bathtub, considering his density with his tiny surface area. Or that water from a bathtub faucet can carry a 200 pound tiny ball of mass that is Scott, when he'd obviously be too dense to be carried by the water. Or even Luis's belt falling on Scott. Then we have this woman stepping on Scott. <laughs> It should have been me, not him! And him stopping her foot. But he'd probably cut through her foot if he sit with so much force and him being that dense and small. Like what Hope says about him holding way more energy when he exerts force onto something. Then he goes jumping on people's feet in the party to get out, as if he could ever jump that high or even land on someone's foot without them feeling it when he weighs 200 fucking pounds. Then he gets sucked by a vacuum cleaner, which could never happen if he weighed the same. That'd be like if you, a fully grown person, were unable to fight the suction of a vacuum cleaner. Do the details really matter? Why don't I put this vacuum up your butt? Though even worse, considering how dense he is. Then he's flung with a mousetrap, which would never have the force to throw a 200 pound human being, let alone one as priceless as Scott Lang. Then later in the film we have ants carrying the Ant-Man suit, which should also be impossible, as the suit would weigh way more than an ant can carry, even if ants can carry 5,000 times their body weight, because 5,000 times 5 milligrams is still only 25 grams. Also, unrelated to his powers, there's no way that Scott can put on a suit in 8 seconds. And this is also before the second movie, when he learned magic while under house arrest. Obviously, I would have accepted this if it happened after that though. Then we have Anthony carrying Scott. An ant carrying a 200 pound man. Also, it really annoys me that Hank is controlling Anthony in that moment, but he flies Anthony in places that put Scott in danger, like inside a woman's hair or landing it on this dude's newspaper. Does Hank want to kill Scott? Or maybe he's just fucking stupid, like how later in his house he's explaining to Scott how those ants can carry the sugar cubes by saying ants can carry 50 times their weight. Ants can lift 5,000 times their weight, not just 50. A sugar cube weighs around 4 grams. Ants weigh approximately 5 milligrams on average. That means the sugar cube is 800 times the weight of the ant. By Hank's line, it just doesn't make sense why the ant can lift the sugar cube. But what does he know? He's only Ant-Man. One thing I want to praise this film for, though, is this moment. One isn't protected by a specialized helmet it can affect the brain's chemistry. I don't think Darren realizes this, and you know, 
He's not the most stable guy to begin with. Because it both explains why Darren Cross goes insane in the third act, and it makes perfect sense that Cross wouldn't know that that's a thing that happens with the particle, considering Hank has always tried to hide everything about the pin particle from him. It sure would be a shame if the second film ignored that established rule. Speaking of, let's get back to the inconsistent rules. Jaren should not be able to hold the shrunken sheep as it away the same as it did before. Now though, we get into the real worst mechanic in the film, going subatomic. The film explains that messing with the regulator means you go subatomic, which sends you to the quantum realm, which Hank describes it as All concepts of time and space become irrelevant as you shrink for all eternity. Everything that you know, gone forever. And I don't understand how Hank knows anything about the Quantum Realm if he's never been there and it's only theoretical. So I guess it makes sense that he's wrong with the shrinking for all eternity if they can shrink and grow in the Quantum Realm and and Man and the Wasp and Quantumania. And it makes sense that time and space aren't irrelevant there considering they can use it to travel in time. And they experience time there as well, but not as the same speed as people outside it do in Endgame. As well as just being able to travel in the Quantum Realm in the second and third films, so space isn't irrelevant. So I suppose Hank is just talking out of his ass in-universe rather than it being inconsistent, which is fine, I guess. But there's the big issue of it being impossible to go subatomic at all. The pin particle only changes the distance between atoms, not the size of atoms. Meaning it can't make anyone become smaller than an atom aka subatomic, if atoms are the foundational and impossible to transform parts of whoever uses the particles to shrink. This means that Janet, Hank's wife and Hope's mother, going subatomic to stop that nuke from hitting a city back when Hank was the Ant-Man makes no sense. She would never have gotten stuck in the quantum realm and basically the second film can't happen, and a huge part of the first one can't either. When Hank mentions the story about Janet going subatomic, he also says, And I spent the next 10 years trying to learn all I could about the quantum realm. You were trying to bring her back. But all I learned was we know nothing. Which makes no sense with him explaining earlier how the quantum realm works to Scott. Unless he really was looking out of his ass just to scare off Scott from messing with the suit's regulator. Then we have the training montage with Scott, and I find it really funny that Scott just kills all those ants that were supposed to help him. I assume these ants come from Hank's stash and not just from anywhere, but they are plentiful anywhere, so it's just funny to think that he kills what are supposed to be his helpers. The film cares about these ants only when it wants to like when Anthony dies, but these filler ants are whatever. It just feels like the film wants to achieve the cute animal character that people care about thing without putting in the work. Anthony is given a name and people therefore care when he dies. I can pick up this pencil, tell you its name is Steve, and go like this. Oh. And part of you dies, just a little bit on the inside, because people can connect with anything. But I guess all the other ants who did just as much as Anthony in this film are disposable because they don't have a name. Damn, feels kinda good when there's no guilt, huh? Then the film introduces the discs, which you can throw at something and make it bigger or smaller using the pin particle. How do they tell where an object ends and another begins? The bottle was on a table, but I guess it knows where the object ends, same for the gnome on the ground. But if it hit a blade of grass, where would it end? The length of that one blade of grass? Or the entire ground? What if it was a car with many different parts connected to each other via gears and shit? What if there were people inside that car? Then there's Scott fighting Falcon, where his hit shouldn't do that much damage to Falcon if the rules aren't that his density changes. If they are, he shouldn't be able to jump that high. He also shouldn't be able to jump on Falcon and stand on him and shit. Or stand on the barrel of his gun. Unless Falcon is just that strong, which he isn't, but he is, but he shouldn't be. He shouldn't be able to be inside Falcon's pack either, and he also flies on Anthony's back in that scene. When the plan to stop Cross is being executed, we see Louise getting into her room and punching a security guard and making him pass out. And I have no idea how nobody outside saw that, considering the glass wall and the fact we just saw a lot of people walking through that corridor, which is also visible to anyone on the other side of the floor as every wall is a glass wall. Then we have our standard Scott on the ants on the water that could never work, as well as the ants carrying devices or Scott being carried up by the ants through the pipe or Anthony carrying him. A bit later, Hank is trying to get into the Pym Tech building for Darren Cross's presentation of his yellow jacket suit but he's stopped by two police officers who have no reason to be here and were only here because the film needed one of these cops, Scott's daughter's stepdad, Paxton, to create some forced conflict here and realize that Scott was in the building so he could arrest Scott later and create some more forced conflict. But also Dave, Scott's friend, to help Hank get into the building, steals Paxton's car, which is baffling to me. How does he manage to drive the cop car? 
surely wouldn't have its keys in, unless these two cops are stupid. This is very important to the plot because Hank needs to get inside the building and he wouldn't be able to unless that had happened. Then later we have more of Anthony carrying Scott, Scott jumping on Anthony and flying on its back, and ants carrying C4, all of which are impossible if the pin particles made the shrunken person or the object retain their mass. Then there's a moment where Cross says that Ant-Man made his yellow jacket and his particle be worth twice the price because Ant-Man fought Falcon and It's not easy to successfully infiltrate an Avengers facility. Thankfully, word travels fast. Which makes no sense. How the fuck does word travel fast if Falcon was the only hero in the facility and he didn't want anyone to know? It's really important to me that Cap never finds out about this. Did one of the people that live or work in that facility just leak that information for no reason? This film is so stupid. I do definitely want to point out as well the hilarity of the Ten Rings dude being there to buy the yellow jacket with a Ten Rings tattoo on his neck. Which isn't very subtle for an organization that works from the shadows, though obviously that's made worse by what's established in Shang-Chi. Then Scott breaks out of the glass containment box for the yellow jacket by using one of the discs, which kinda proves my point about them. How can they tell what to grow? It apparently only broke the glass, but it's a whole lot of things together to make that glass ball that Scott was in. How can the disc tell what it's supposed to grow when it hits it? How is it supposed to tell something apart from another if they're in touch or connected via some mechanism? We also have Paxton and his partner being absolutely useless, as they had captured Dave and Kurt quite a while ago, at least a few minutes, and still haven't cuffed them, despite having them on the ground with their hands behind their backs. Then we have Hope and Scott being absolutely brain dead as they let Darren Cross leave the Yellow Jacket vault. Why would Scott and Hope let him leave? Those two and Hank were the only people in the vault with Cross after the Hydra dude ran out with a particle, and apparently Scott and Hope were checking on Hank's wound, so why didn't at least Scott fight Cross instead of stopping there and allowing Cross to leave? I guess Cross was leaving when he was being bitten by the ants, but why would they let him leave? They can very easily stop him, especially as he's dealing with the fucking ants. Hope and Scott just stopped to watch as Cross and Hydra Dude left the vault instead of trying to stop them, which, as far as they know, would save the world. Hope even says this, Go get that suit. Which implies she knows the importance of that. So why didn't either of them stop Cross from leaving? This also makes me think of the fact that Hydra has access to the pin particle after this. It's never addressed after this film and... By this point, I don't see a reason why it would be addressed. When Hydra is a thing of the past in the MCU, and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. had beaten Hydra and destroyed or taken most of their resources anyway by that point. Ant-Man director Peyton Reed has revealed that the film originally ended with Mitchell Carson being apprehended by Ant-Man. At the end of the movie, he gets away and has these cross particles, and there was a sequence where Ant-Man has an encounter with him, and then for a couple of reasons, it felt like maybe we should leave these particles out there. In that original thing, he took Martin Donovanot and got the particles. That's definitely a case of me just not knowing to, what to do with the script. Then we're back with the inconsistent rules. Scott running on the gun is impossible. Scott running on the guy is impossible. Scott running on the miniature models is impossible. Then the funniest one of them all is Hank carrying a keychain of a tank that is an actual tank. A tank that weighs 26.5 tons that he just carries around in his pocket because fuck the rules that were established about the retention of mass and then oh no anthony died anthony! a bunch of other flying ants died too but this one had a name so i guess it's sad now oh man also scott is riding on ants again because the film doesn't remember its rules i also really don't understand why scott just let his fleet of ants go when he was chasing the helicopter Surely it would be way better to go up there with them, so they could swarm the people that Scott is too busy to attack at the moment. Scott also lands on Darren's gun. He also gets slapped away, but it'd be like slapping a bullet away. Even going by what Hope said about how his strength works and not just extrapolating how his powers were said to work. Then Scott jumps on a piece of wood or something in the air to gain momentum, which is something that doesn't make sense in general with how gravity works, but especially with how dense Scott is, he would never be able to do that or even be jumping around in the helicopter as he's shown to do here. Also, apparently Scott can run on walls? Since when was that a thing? Scott and Darren should be weighing down this briefcase as they fall to the same 
being cornered and are pulled by gravity, being so much heavier and denser than anything else inside. Also, considering their mass and density and how far they fell, the splash in the water should have been bigger and they should have died from the fall. If their suits are protecting them, which is unclear, since Scott seems to believe Cross shooting him from the back of his helmet would kill him earlier, but they survive quite a bit in this film. I'm willing to assume the yellow jacket suit would be able to handle it, not being made out of what seems to be rubber but actually metal, and being made specifically to be sold to armies and military. And also, to be fair to their fall, Yellow Jacket can fly, so we can assume his waist wouldn't contribute to their fall, if we're being generous, but the issue still remains. If Scott's suit can save him from falling that high from a helicopter, and if, when he's smaller, his mass doesn't maintain and he really is lighter, turning back into normal size when falling on that grill makes no sense, it's like he's trying to hurt himself. A ping pong paddle could never throw Yellow Jacket that far away, especially when he's coming towards Scott that fast because he'd basically be a bullet in terms of energy and strength. Freeze! Put your hands up! Get him up! <laughs> Turns out Scott isn't only dense in terms of his molecular composition. If Scott really thought he should have killed Yellow Jacket, why did he put his hands up when Paxton asked him to? Surely he would have just gone small and then grabbed Yellow Jacket and ran away. Scott put his own daughter in danger through his incompetence. He has trained to be able to turn small on a whim and use that to his advantage. You need to be skillful, agile, and above all, you need to be fast. You should be able to shrink and grow on a dime. So your size always suits your needs. But I guess he forgot that when the plot needed him to. Then we have the fight in Cassie's bedroom. If Scott's jumps send him as far as we've seen they do, why isn't he jumping after Yellow Jacket instead of running, when he could very easily be hit by one of his lasers by running this way? He even jumps like 15 seconds later and it clearly was what he should have done from the start. Then Cross riding on the train toy makes no sense. He'd crush it with his weight. And Ant could never have enough force to actually hurt Yellow Jacket or damage his suit as it was doing. Ants are very weak when we compare it to a 200 pound man in a military armor. Which also brings up the fact that it does make sense Scott would be able to throw the train cars if he retains his mass and his strength, though he shouldn't be able to move that fast as to throw something, but anyway, but it's also pointless to do that since they could never hurt Darren. At the same time, they shouldn't be able to stand on it, so what do I know? Though he throws an arch piece from the train set and it does hurt Darren. If Scott can grab it no problems though, how does it actually have that much force when hitting Darren? Even if it is from Scott's throw, it's a little wooden piece against an intensely dense ball of mass that is... Yellow Jacket. And now, I guess the train doesn't have that much force and weight anymore because of a joke. But earlier it was being thrown as if it would do anything to throw it. It's also weighing its normal weight when thrown at Scott. If it never weighed anything, what were the stakes of the strain bit? Scott should be trying to get closer to Darren, not throwing things at him that would do nothing to him. I suppose he could have been using them as a distraction, but he throws the arch piece at Darren when he's distracted, so I guess not. It does work though, even if it shouldn't. And the same scene shows it shouldn't by the train not doing anything to Darren or Scott. Scott, he needs us, you know what I'm saying? How did Luis and the guys even know that Scott was at his daughter's house? Scott couldn't have told them, and the only other people there are the police, which also would never have told them, especially as Louise wasn't expecting to see them there. Bag it up. Bag it up slow. Yeah. Bag it, bag it up. I guess maybe Louise had a plan to get Cassie to keep her safe, but he got there after everything had gone down already? But that's very silly considering Scott was arrested and fought Yellow Jacket and got there first, whereas Louise and his friends had nowhere else to go really. Once again, the ants shouldn't be able to do anything to Darren, but this also makes me wonder why he wasn't flying the whole time, considering it's much easier to attack Scott that way, rather than on a fucking toy train. Yeah, I agree! How the fuck? Can anyone rebound one of the discs? This makes no sense. If that's the case, it could rebound off any static structure too, depending on the angle it's thrown, which is impossible to control. These rebounds also cause the embiggening discs to head an ant and the Thomas the Tank Engine toy, both of which should float away, being made so much bigger as they would be lighter than air if their mass is maintained. When Paxton runs into his house, why didn't he shoot Darren right away? He's clearly very justified in doing it here, even if not by law. Morally, he's just defending his daughter. His character would do that when he's also shown to care for Cassie more than anything else. Scott would not be able to land on Yellow Jacket without him feeling the force from a 200 pound man on his back. 
and Darren also shouldn't be able to squeeze Scott. And then Scott going subatomic, as well as Janet doing it years ago in the universe of the film, would create black holes. Even if we ignore that you can't go subatomic by the rules established, their density would be so insanely big that they would create black holes considering their size. Black holes with enough mass to be able to sustain themselves and destroy Earth. The math is outlined in MatPat's Ant-Man video, and it is correct. This is one of the most disastrous things with the world building in the MCU, because they kept establishing the rules had to do with changing volume, but not mass. The result of that is so catastrophic that the entire world would be destroyed. I really don't understand why they had to go into the science of the particle. They could have just said it shrinks you, but makes you stronger and more agile, without explaining how or why. Just letting it be some sci-fi bullshit like how vibranium is handled. Which is why Captain America's shield is fine to exist in this universe. That thing does not obey the laws of physics at all. But they just had to explain the pin particle in scientific terms, which means we need to apply the established rules logically to what we're seeing and none of it adds up. Also, this has always bugged me, but if all it takes to leave the quantum realm is putting one of the embiggening disks inside the regulator, how didn't Janet figure that one out in however many years she was stuck there? After Scott gets out of the quantum realm, he says he doesn't remember anything about what happened when he was in there. You don't remember anything. Hank, I, I don't. Well, I suppose the human mind just can't comprehend the experience. I don't have anything to add to this, so I don't really know why I brought it up. When did this happen? Nothing's happening. Scott and Hope getting together in this way is fine. It seems to be making fun of the fact that the two weren't romantically interested in each other, but Scott is impulsive and Hope wants to pull off some steam. My issue comes with the two being so damn close off-screen in the next film and apparently Quantumania. And finally, I don't understand how Paxton kept Scott out of jail. Something happened with the cameras. Circuits got fried. But I told them that you were processed correctly. Just because the cameras had a technical glitch doesn't mean that Scott isn't guilty of what he was charged with or that he didn't break out of prison when he was supposed to be in his cell. He's just let off entirely Scott free. Now, as you can tell, this film is a nightmare from a logical standpoint. It's foundationally broken because of establishing the rules for the pin particle, which if you don't care that the film breaks those rules, good for you. This video really isn't for you, but it really bugs me because everything in this film that happens because of those broken rules irritates me and makes every payoff feel hollow. However, on a character level, this film isn't bad. It's extremely surface level with basically every character, but they're all consistent. And despite her not getting much development in this film, it does lay down some good groundwork for Hope's character going forward. Can't wait to see what they do with that. I do appreciate Scott's arc, even if it's not any Citizen Kane of character exploration, believe it or not. Scott learns the lesson from Hank to help save the world to earn the look in his daughter's eyes. At the same time that obviously this means Scott should be a hero or something, it's still relating to his daughter. He sacrifices himself in the end because he's saving his daughter more so than saving the world. He wants her to be safe. Daddy, help! I love you, Cassie. It makes sense why Scott would put himself on the line as Ant-Man if he wants to earn his daughter's admiration and be the good guy, to not be a crook, for once. However, this brings me to Captain America Civil War. Scott's character joining Cap's team makes no sense. Because Civil War has him becoming a fugitive by helping Cap, despite Scott not knowing the full picture of the fight with Iron Man. He doesn't know which side is right, and if he should put himself on the line to fight Avengers. Especially as it makes him a criminal. We're outside the law on this one. So if you come with us, you're a wanted man. Yeah, well, what else is new? and means he wouldn't be able to see his daughter by doing this. The least you could have done in Civil War was have a scene where Scott refuses the call to action at first, where maybe Falcon talks to him and explains the situation fully, and explains how important it is, how it's bigger than just Scott and they need his help. Damn, that was a good speech. Or have Scott agree to help, but in stealth mode or something, so that he can still be free after this is done, but then you could eventually pay that off by him embiggening to save someone's life or something, and it would actually work off of Scott's character. Imagine having character conflict, imagine Scott being more than just a silly little guy. Scenes that do more than just say, Scott's here now. Not in my MCU movie. Also, Scott becoming Giant Man in Civil War makes no sense, as he would be extremely light. Lighter than air, and he would float away. But Civil War is having to work off the bullshit contradictions from the first Ant-Man film, so I blame Ant-Man more than Civil War. Now, unfortunately, there was a sequel to Ant-Man, one of the most painfully, insufferably terrible and mind-numbingly boring films ever made, Ant-Man and the Wasp, which I'll talk about in part 2 of this video coming out a week from now. Goodbye.